Thank you. So let's first see what kind of crowd do we have here. Who here maintains more than five websites? Wow, most of the room. Ten? Do you get enough sleep? Mm. OK. So about, I started building websites about 10 years ago. And it was mostly, I mostly focused on technology. I would try to find a client, and then I would convince the client that they need to use the latest and greatest technology because I'm a web geek. I build, I build websites. And it's, while it's fun building sites where I make a toy project, it's even better if somebody pays me to learn new technology. But then as I would evolve my business, I l learned that I need to focus on clients. So what, they, what are they selling and what they need? And it turns out that as soon as you start listening to your clients not, and not trying to push the technology, the technology part becomes easy. I can take a website, make a small adjustments, put on a new design, and bam. And I have a new website, and the client is happy. So these are some of the websites. So on this grid, there's 25 of them that I maintained this year. The oldest site on this uh, screenshot is over 10 years now in production and the latest we deployed just last week. And I expect that by the end of the year, I'll probably have to maintain another 10 or 15 websites. So what's the problem? As I, as I was scaling up my business, at some point I realized this is exhausting. I needed to clone myself, and that wasn't an option. The problem is that as, as I got more clients, it got increasingly dif more difficult to maintain my sites that I was building in the past. And everybody tells you the reasons, but it's worth noting because the th things I'm going to talk about espe address especially this. And the reason was that um, technical debt, that it was just too much. You all know the moment when a client calls you and says, we changed our phone number. You need to change it right now. And the good thing is Joomla was really big in 2008. And that site is still working. And because you made everything read-only, it's not a problem. Nobody hacked it yet. But the client needs the thing changed. So what do you do? Open up FTP client, make a quick hack, everything works. You do that a couple of times, no way you can maintain that. But the client still wants changes from you. So quick hacks. Bad idea. The second thing is, we all love our preprocessor. Compass, Foundation, Sassy, Bootstrappy, you know, whatever fancy technology is popular this year, and what was popular in 2005. The fun part is when you take your latest, greatest Mac and you realize that you need Foundation that you would install as a Ruby gem and that it won't install on your latest Ruby version and it maybe even disappears from the internet. I don't know why we want to install CSS frameworks as Ruby gems, but at some point we thought that was a good idea. So I would, I would want to make a design change, by my, but my CSS wouldn't compile. So I would spend another half a day just making it all work. And lastly, because I was always, because the way we do CMSs around days, and you really have to think about, if you look at WordPress, everything ch happens on the server. You flip the switch, it's on the database. You upgrade the plugins in place. So half a year later, when you want to update your local development version, you have to download things from the server, synchronize database, and it's just annoying. It makes your life much ha harder. So the, the problem because of that was that it just it just meant that when I needed to switch the project, it would cost me about half a day again of contextual switch. Luckily, in that time, as a solo web developer, I also had the opportunity to work in larger teams. And it turns out that when you work in a startup, you would have dedicated ops people. And in my case, that the ops are system administrators. And I see there are quite a, a, few, a lot of you with long beards, so I assume you know your Unix. OK, good. 
Anyway, so the ops people, what they would do is they would make sure that developers can do their job without actually having to worry about the servers, and that the servers would, be, would run despite everything. And because you know, every couple of years we need a new buzzword, they call it the DevOps. And under the DevOps brand, they made sure that system administrators talk to developers, and everything is great. And in our case, because it's a collaborative, so it's something in our, in our heads, we can, we can, get the, we can have, the bo we can have both, both pieces of the cake. There's no system administrator to share it with. So a lot of us here are most primarily developers. And so I want to make sure that we're clear about what do system administrators do. And what they do is they make sure everything is running smoothly without any manual changes, and that they monitor. So when the server goes down, when the data center is on fire, they make sure that the, the one in another country starts, and so on. So this is my version of a high-level diagram and what we're going to work today with. On one side, we have the development environment. That's your nice, fancy Mac, for example, or whatever you use to develop. And on the other side, it's your cloud. And because everything is a cloud now, that might be a shared hosting. It might be Amazon Cloud. But it's most likely, if, you, if my clients are any indication, it's probably mediocre shared hosting that you paid about 5 to 10 euros per month. It's OK, but it's not going to save the world. But most importantly, your administrator of that server doesn't care. If the PHP there is running or whatever you're using, they're done, as far as concerned. So first thing first. So if we look at the, the, the way this works is, on one side, we want to push this code to the server. And then on the other, we want to transfer the code from the server to your, compu to your computer. And so technical term for copying the code to the server is deploying. And if you think about your deployment process, it means that you, need depend you have some certain dependencies. So that might be your CSS framework, your libraries, anything you need to get the code compiling. The second thing is you need to build it. And once again, if you're, if you're building it in a way that means that you need to fill settings, it just, it's hard. So you need to have that as a separate process. You, want to, you need to package it and then copy to the server. And the thing that I want you to take away from this talk is this needs to be a single shell script. <coughs> you're done coding, you commit to a Git repository or whatever you use for version control, and then you run deploy. And as you run deploy script, you want it to to move to a se separate directory. So if you remove that. So you want it to be, have a git checkout. You want it to run the dependency management stuff, build process, and then copy it to server. And if you make it automatic, you can make sure that it's, it saves your time. In, so let me just put that again in the terms of, for example, WordPress developer. So as a WordPress developer, I care about my CSS framework, and I would manage my dependencies with Bower and package.json. I would use Grunt or Gulp to build my team files, and then use some sort of script to package it up in a zip file and transfer it to the server. If I can make that a single command line script, that's all I need. As I talk to different, different, mostly designers and younger developers, they would know all of that, but they would know it in a way to, I need to use that user interface application, copy those files over, and so on. It wouldn't be automatic. So that's the automation part of the ops team. It's worth noting that once you want to deploy to a server, you have two different options. First one is you might have things on your SSH server. So you have remote shell access. You run the build process on the server. 
the only thing you want to be really careful is your, don't just do git checkout into your Teams folder unless you want everybody to have your source code. So make sure you don't expose your .git files to the internet. Second process, it turns out it's mostly the same, but you just run it on your computer. And in that case, all the, step, all the steps or scripts are the same. You just automate the last step uh, with uh, LFTP or NCFTP. So what are the benefits of that? So why do you need to have a single script? It means that you can follow good development practices. Everything is in version control, no quick hacks. You can, make, you can replicate your build process because you're always making sure that you download the dependencies and run it again. And you can also share it with your team. So you give, it, you give the script to the designer, they can push if you trust them or your other developer. And it's easy really quickly to deploy because you can make quick changes, you're, not, you're less likely to make ugly hacks on the server. And it goes the same thing the other way around. You want to have a single script that will dump your remote database and, ex and restore it on your computer. You, want, and you also want to copy all the uploaded contents because everything is now uploaded directly on the server as far as image files are concerned, as well as plugin, plugins. But most importantly, as soon as you wrote, write your first script, start making a system. We don't document our code, and it's just not realistic. I'm not going to write my deployment procedures, but if I can codify it, if I can write them in script and have a system, then it doesn't matter. If a client calls me from six years ago, I run sync script, bam, my environment is ready. If I need to deploy something that I last touched four years ago, just Update the code, run deploy, everything is there. I don't care about how I get it, what FTP passwords are, what are the shell access, and so on. It just works. And that's actually the trick, how you can have 30 websites, because everything is done for me by the shell scripts. So it turns out that as soon as people start thinking about their shell scripts, they're there are other smarter people from them that actually wrote all the abstraction layers for them. So look it up. Probably your content management system already has certain wrappers that can automate other parts of your life. So creating users, dumping the database, importing stuff, and so on. So let's talk a bit about ops. So we have the, your development environment is ready. You can share it. The problem with ops is you are the only technical person for your client. They will, you sold them the website, you might charge them for maintenance, might not, but if the website doesn't work, they will call you because they don't have anybody else to call. And the moment they call you, if you don't know what's happening with the website, you look bad. So set up some sort of uptime monitoring. You don't need, you don't need expensive systems, Go to uptimerobot.com, and they will give you an, uh, a free monitoring service, and just make sure that you have all the steps set up. So a script that will download, that will make sure that there's like a copyright by company name, and that they can read it. And you'll soon re realize that name servers fail, clients forget to update their, their domain names, your hosting provider might change IP address every couple of years. And if you have an email from the uptime service, you're in a much better position to help your client. They might still call you, but you will get an early warning, and you can make sure that you start looking up. Second thing that you want to set up for yourself is error reporting. Who here is trying to read the error.log on their server? OK. There are way too many hands. <laughs> so there are services like Get Sentry and others that will install global exception handlers for all of your unhandled exceptions, and they will send you an email with stack trace. And that will allow you to get much better reports than your clients would send you. And it also means that because you're getting emails from your service, 
as you deploy your script, you, get, you immediately start to get error scripts. It, it doesn't take about two weeks before your client finally lo looks at your website and tells you this doesn't work. It gives me errors. You just get emails. And if so, Sentry has a free plan. And if you don't, if you don't want to upgrade their hosted service, you can also host it for yourself. So, to wrap, to wrap up. Your final setup should look like something like that. Your process between the, the server is automated both ways, and there's always a single script that does that for you. On the cloud, you have both error and uptime monitoring. If you can get that running in a way that's consistent for all your client websites, you're already better than most of the freelancers I know. And there are quite a few unnamed agencies that don't have that in place. But it will allow you to provide good quality service for your clients. So what's the technology? We all love about our technology buzzwords. Turns out that every big company today has its own IT automation framework. They're all complete <coughs> overkill. So what they're built to do is, the plan is how do you maintain 100 servers and make sure they all work. It, and that's nice, but you have 30 websites that you need them to work each in their own unique way. Which, uh, and that means, at the end of the day, that any framework you pick will work for you, because you just need a small subset of their functionality. So that, that means that it's the ease of use that you care about. And in my experience, find a system administrator at your local user group or a friend that has the longest beard, and you can have the beer with, and just use whatever he's using. And that way, that when you start writing your scripts, you can go to them and say, well, look what I did. What do you think? And they will go, hmm, yes, that's good, but you're thinking about this in a wrong way. And that's something you cannot pick up from Stack Overflow or reading documentation, because they already made that mistake, and they will share their experience with you. And lastly, slow down a bit. I know it's a really good business to be a software developer. Easy to get, cli get clients. If you do quality work, people will, will not stop calling you to make them more websites. So slow down and re think, how can you replace yourself with a small shell script? And that will allow you to actually pick more clients and do better work so you can then scale up your business and just enjoy your life as a freelancer. If that was interesting, you can download the slides at the URL or send me a tweet and I'll try to help you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have seven minutes for questions, so... Um, how do you solve the problem when uh, you have packages, uh, for example, down downloaded from NPM or RubyGems, and it stops working at some point because maybe uh, a new patch broke it or something. Do you download it and save it somewhere, or uh, do you understand the question? Yes. So the question was, how do you version your old libraries and within your environment, right? Okay. So what I've done in the past is most of the software open source repositories have Git are on GitHub. I can always fork it and pin it to a specific version if it's not in the official repositories anymore. And second thing is most of the repositor most of the package management systems will will have specific version pinning. In the case that that your package manager would be too new to use your really old version, you might need to build your own self a virtual machine where you can run those scripts.